The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the greatness of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Good morning. How you guys doing? Still good? Seems like I've been up here doing this already, so... That's all right. I like chatting with you. Okay. So here's what's up. Uh, you might be looking at this whole thing going on and being like, wow, what's going on? Uh, Advent. We started talking about it last week. If you weren't here last week, I would highly encourage you to go online uh, to our webpage and you can listen to the podcast or you can watch the video because it gave a lot of the, uh, the background and, and the reasoning why we do it and, and things like that. So that might be helpful. But just to touch base on that, just to kind of if, you, if you're not going to do that, then listen to this, and I'll give you kind of a cliff notes of last week. Um, Advent comes from a Latin word, which means coming, okay? So Advent is most of the time seen as a time to reflect on the birth of Christ and his coming to this earth, but originally it was actually a time to start anticipating his second coming. So for us as the church, what we do uh, during this season is we... Uh, what we're supposed to do is focus on this time as, okay, this is a celebration of the birth of Christ when he came to this earth, but also that every day he's with us. And so uh, it's a continual process of him coming and then uh, initially uh, continuing to anticipate uh, his return when he comes back. So it's not just about reading some scripture and lighting some candles, although uh, that's part of it. And so that's why we did that this morning and the Pittmans helped us out there. Um, so we're to remember all that God has done for us by sending Jesus to the earth. Remember all that God is doing in and through us right now. That's the Emmanuel part, right? The God with us. And then to remember and look forward to all he's going to do for us when he sends Jesus to return. Okay. Now, quick lesson on what's going on right here because you guys might be like, Anybody like, what's this all about? Haven't been in church for a while or haven't ever seen, how about this? If you've only been to Life Change Church, you've probably never seen this. Um, <clears throat> okay, so the wreath and the candles are full of symbolism tied to the Christmas season, okay? The wreath itself, which is made of various uh, plastic that look like evergreens, um, signifies continuous life. The circle of the wreath, which has no beginning or end, symbolizes the eternity of God, the immort immortality of the soul, and the everlasting life we find in Christ. The candles also have their own special significance. The four candles represent the four weeks of Advent, and one candle is lit each Sunday. Three of the candles are purple, because the color violet is a litur liturgical color that signifies a time of prayer, penance, and sacrifice. The pink candle is the joy candle, because pink is the litur liturgical color for joy. The first candle, which is purple, symbolizes hope. It's something also called the prophecy candle in remembrance of the prophets, especially Isaiah, which was what was, written for, written, uh, what was read from this morning, who foretold the birth of Christ. It represents the expectation felt in the anticipation of the coming Messiah. Okay? Whew. So today we're going to be talking about hope is basically what all that means. Um, now, first we're going to talk about the definition of the word hope. Hope can be defined in a lot of ways. It can be used as a noun or a verb, okay? So a verb is like an action word, okay? So yesterday, I have an example of an action word, a verb, when I use the word hope, okay? Now, you might be thinking one thing, but just don't, because you don't even know what I'm talking about. <laughs> yesterday, my wife uh, bought all of the material required uh, to construct a fruitcake, okay? Because it was like, this time of year, it's fruitcake, right? There's fruitcake, and I don't know if I'd ever actually tried a fruitcake. So it was like, okay, well, you know, maybe we should check this out. And she said her mom likes fruitcake, so she's going to make fruitcake. So the fruitcake process, if you've never made one, is lengthy, okay? Like six hours or something of soaking this and doing that and baking this and putting it all together. And I hoped, beyond hope, that I would like it. <laughs> I mean, I hoped that... All this time and energy she spent putting these things together, I hoped that I would like it. 
Unfortunately, that hope was not realized. <laughs> There's a comedian, Jim Gaffigan. He says, fruit, good. Cake, great. Fruitcake, nasty crap. Okay? <laughs> that is how I feel about fruitcake. I love my wife. She can cook anything and make it taste good. Honestly, not fruitcake. So... Then we gave one to her mom, and I was thinking, are you mad at your mom? <laughs> like, you're going to actually give this to her? She texted later, oh, that fruitcake was delicious. I was like, what is wrong with you? <laughs> She's not in here right now, so it's okay. We can chat about her. Hoping for something, okay? So then there's hope as the noun, and the noun obviously is a person, place, or thing. Hope as a noun is what we're going to be talking about today, okay? If I said hope is on the way, that would be looking at it as a noun, that it's something that is on the way. And this morning as we celebrate this first Sunday of Advent and as Jason and Angela came up and lit this purple candle, symbolizing that Jesus Christ is our hope, then we are to be those that look forward to this truth that Jesus actually is our hope. He is our hope. Now, has anyone ever misplaced their hope like I did with the fruitcake? This season of Christmas is famous for misplaced hopes, right? I can remember as a kid, um, when I was growing up, my, my parents uh, divorced, and then um, my dad remarried, and I lived with him and my stepmom, and, and I had a brother, a stepbrother, who was like a month older than me. Um, and so we pretty much always got the same presents. You know, it was, like, it was like we were twins, but I was better looking, I think, something like that. Anyways, <laughs> just joking, not really. Okay, uh, Anyways, we had these two big packages under the Christmas tree. And you know, as a kid, man, it's a big package. That's something. This box was huge. And I was thinking, oh, and the hope that just rose in me, like, oh, man, man, I hope that this is, you know, something really cool. Like, I don't even, I didn't even know. Like, my mind was just like, I don't even know. It's so big. What is it? It was a comforter (laughs) for my bed. And my brother had a matching one. So it was awesome, right? (laughs) It was horrible. Like, my hope was dashed. Like, Santa, what is wrong with you? It's this idea about misplaced hope. We've all done it. We probably all still do it to some degree. But we place hope, as adults, we place hope in things that are far more detrimental, I think, to us. We place hope in stuff. We place hope in situations or in people or a person. Sometimes we place hope in our government or an ideology or a system or some projected image that we think we're supposed to be. Or we place hope in our success or money or promotion or getting the right job or getting into the right college or getting your kids into the right college or whatever it is. We put our hope in all these things. And the bottom line is we're placing our hope in a thousand different areas that are never, never, ever, never going to give us what we're looking for. There's this book. Some of you may have read it. I have not. I just did some research on it. It's called Lonesome Dove. There's a guy in there named Jake Spoon. He's promising a lady named Lorena, 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 that he will take her away from Lonesome Dove, which I guess is the place that they live, and take her to San Francisco. There's this other guy named Augustus McRae, and he knows that Jake is kind of a scoundrel, okay? And he says, hey, Jake's too leaky of a vessel to put much hope in. And then he goes on and says, but then again, don't all vessels leak to some degree? See, there's so many things we put our hope in, but they're all going to fail. Sometimes we think something's going to work out a certain way or give us some kind of fulfillment or satisfy some aching or longing or it's going to deliver us. But here's what you have to know. Everything on this side of heaven leaks to some degree. Hope in the Bible means a confident expectation in the future. It means a a contagious enthusiasm for what will come. The idea of hope is that you're looking forward to the future with enthusiasm, with confidence, with expectation, that there's blessing on the other end of this, right? Hope is a good thing. Sometimes we think, well, I just, I don't want to hope for anything because it always gets ruined. Don't, Don't get into that mindset. We're just hoping for the wrong things. So if we ask ourselves the question, if if all the vessels leak, who or what can I put my hope in? And we have an answer, okay? Open to Romans chapter 15. We're going to be in verse 13. 
of Romans chapter 15. And as you're turning there, I'm going to get you up to speed in the book of Romans. Paul is the author of the book of Romans, and he writes uh, this letter to the church in Rome. That's why it's called Romans. And it's seriously, it's like the book of Romans is like a masterpiece, I think. It's like one of Paul's best, in my opinion, all right? Like, if I ha- somebody once said, like, if you could only have one chapter in the whole entire Bible, the rest of your life, that's all you could have to read, to study, to, to know, to talk about. You know, a lot of you guys might think, oh, for Dale, that'd be somewhere in James, because I love James. I love that book a lot. Um, but actually, it would be chapter 8 of Romans, because it's just, it's just beautiful. But Paul starts talking about how all of us are condemned before the Lord. But this good and gracious God has made a way for us. He starts talking about the promises given to Abraham, and then in chapter 5 he talks about justification. And then in chapter 6 and 7 he talks about sanctification. Chapter 8 he talks about glorification. If you don't know what all those are, I will talk about those some other time. Um, But then he talks about God calling people to himself, and he's just laying out these beautiful truths of our salvation. And then and this all happens in chapters 1 to 11. And then in chapter 12, he turns. And there's this word. It says, therefore, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to him. This is your spiritual act of worship. That's chapter 12. He says, therefore, and he turns this corner. And he says, now that I've given you this foundation, here's what you need to do, right? Here's how you can actually take all these ideas and allow them to work themselves out in your life. And chapters 12, 13, 14, 15, that's what he's doing. And then in 16, he ends up with all these personal greetings, okay? But in chapter 15, the first 12 verses, Paul's laying out the promises given to the Jews and the Gentiles, and he kind of summarizes that in, chapter, in, in verse 13 of chapter 15. He's laid out like this, this whole thing, this beautiful, rich theology masterpiece to us of all that God has done for us in Christ. Talks about how the truths work themselves out in our daily lives. And then it's almost... It's almost like Paul puts his pen down and just says this little prayer. And I want to read it to you. He says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. That's where we're going to spend our time today, talking about hope. Because that's like bookended, hope and hope. It's like hope, hope. We like hope, right? Okay. We don't like the bad hope where we just put it in stuff that's never going to satisfy. But when we put our hope in him, it's completely different, okay? We can um, learn how and who to put our hope in. So number one, if you're taking notes, write down the word he, simply. It's him, he, the God of all hope. That's what it says. The God of hope, may the God of hope, okay? If we want to know where we can place our hope, our hope, He is the only one we can place our hope in. It is God alone. He is both the source of our hope and the supplier of our hope at the exact same time, which is pretty awesome, right? Right out of the gate here, Paul says, may the God of hope. He's declaring something about the very, like the the essence and the nature of God. He's, He's making a statement here. He's not just the one who inspires hope. He actually created, he's the author of hope. He is hope. He doesn't just like dole it out to people. It describes who he is. See, it's not just that God's giving hope, but it's really about his very nature and his character that he is the hope. That means hope is not based on probabilities, but it's based on promises. You guys get that? It's not based on probabilities. It's based on promises. I'll explain it to you, okay? All the hope we have, all the misplaced hopes, they're based on probabilities. It's based on this kind of uh, wish. Wish and hope that something may or may not come true. Wish and hope that this good thing will happen or this other thing won't happen. Whether it's a, whether it's a person or a thing or somebody running down the aisle, it doesn't matter, right? Whatever it is, you're banking your probabilities on something that's going to happen. Ah, we just go with the flow around here. All right. But... The God of hope, it's different. We're not banking on probabilities. We're banking on promises. Promises. Promises that God himself has made to us. In the book of Titus, the Apostle Paul, again, writing to Titus, he says, and this is a God who cannot lie. When he promises to do these things, he will do them. 
The things that he has promised you, they will happen, okay? Jesus will return. It's not a probability, it's a promise. There is no condemnation in Christ. That's not a probability, that's a promise. You really are forgiven and cleansed in Christ. That's not a probability, that's a promise. You really will receive a reconciled and fully redeemed and resurrected body at some point. That's a promise. It's, it's, yeah, praise the Lord, right? These things are going to happen. You can totally put your hope in these things because they are what God says and God promises, right? Our hope is not to be based on probabilities but on promises. And when Paul says, may the God of hope, he's saying, may the one who authors it, may the one who has sourced it, may the origin of hope, may this God of hope, may he do what it is he says he's gonna do, which we know is true. So there is no reason for us to ever worry about it. And what is it he says that he's going to do in here? Fill you. And I love this. That he may fill you. Not just a little bit, but full. He is our hope. Listen, if you don't listen to the other three points that I have today, that's totally cool. No problem at all. Just remember this one. He is our hope, and he wants to fill us. So what does he want to fill us with? All right. Number two, you can write down the word overflow, ing. <laughs> My notes are sometimes different than the PowerPoint. Overflowing. Overflowing with joy, okay? Paul talks about joy more than any other author in the New Testament, which is kind of funny to me because when I read Paul's stuff, uh, sometimes I'm like, I don't even know what he's talking about because he's super intellectual. Some of his sentences literally go on for so long it's like just another comma and another comma and another comma, and it's like, ah, oh, what's going on? But, but here's the deal. If someone were to ask me, okay, what do you think Paul writes about the most? I, w I would be like, I don't know, probably, I don't know, sanctification or some big word that I don't really totally understand. No, it's joy. He says it's the mark of a Christian, overflowing joy. So what is this joy that he's going to fill us with? Is it about putting on a happy face? It's about walking around and whistling zippity doo dah. You should try to spell that because I got it in my notes, but I know it's spelled wrong. <laughs> it's about never getting bummed out or depressed or worried or any of that, mad. See, when Paul talks about joy, he's talking about this inward satisfaction of the soul. All right? He's not talking about a bubbly personality type. He's not talking about, you know, I don't know. You guys know those people that are just like always cheery? Is that what he's talking about? I mean, they could be filled with joy. I'm not saying that they're not. I'm just saying that's not what he's talking about. He's talking about this inward, this, this uh, inward satisfaction of the soul that wells up at, uh, with the delight in knowing who God is and that he fills us, right? Like this, this satisfaction that no matter what's going on on the outside, I'm his son, or you're his daughter. You're his daughter or son. That, that the God of the universe, that's my dad. That's my father, and he loves me. It's, it's, a lot different than, it's a lot different than the realities that most of us deal with, okay? When we tap into it, it gives us the ability to walk through situations that are not great in a way where we state Stay tuned in to the one we find our joy in. You guys get it? Think about it. Paul is writing like crazy about all this joy, yet he goes through some of the worst circumstances. Like in his, I mean, some of the stuff, just listen to this. This is in 2 Corinthians, and he's writing to the Corinthians, and he's writing, um, he's writing about his, his sufferings because he's trying to, show people who Jesus is. And just listen to this right here. He says, Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they Abraham's descendants? So am I. Are they servants of Christ? I'm not out of my mind to talk like this. I am more. I have worked much harder, been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely, and been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. <clears throat> Once I was pelted with stones, three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, 
in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from the Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, in danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face a daily pressure of my concern for all the churches. Who is weak and I do not feel weak? Who is led into sin and I do not inwardly burn? I mean, come on. That's a lot, right? But then even if you look at Jesus, right? Talk about joy. It said, the Bible says that it was for the joy set before him that he endured the cross. Think of that. Think of Jesus enduring the cross because of the joy set before him. There's nothing good and happy and bubbly about those situations at all, but they overflowed with joy. They had this inward satisfaction of the soul that they served this God of hope, that they knew where their hope lied. So let us be those who overflow with joy no matter what the circumstances going on around us or even maybe what's going on up here. Don't let those things dictate, right? That's harder. To, okay, listen, I'm going to stand up here and tell you that. I'm also going to tell you right now, it's real easy to say. It's a lot harder to walk out. Okay, so don't get down on yourself if you're like, oh man, I stink at that. So do I. I'm just saying we, this is what we need to move forward in as we look to this God of hope. All right, number three, you can write down the word peace. This is the other thing that we're to be filled with, right? It says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. And it's really interconnected, all right? Joy and peace. In peace, he's talking about an inward, uh, not an inward satisfaction of the soul, but an inward settleness of the soul, okay? There's a rest and contentment and ease that comes through the Holy Spirit when we, put our, when, when we are tuned in and being filled by the God of hope. Charles Spurgeon says this, um, peace is resting joy. Joy is dancing peace. Joy cries Hosanna before the well-beloved, but peace leans her head on his bosom. We work with joy and we rest with peace. Sky Leon Morris describes the interplay between joy and peace. He says, Joy relates to the delight of anticipation in seeing one's hopes fulfilled, and peace results from the assurance that God will fulfill those hopes. Joy and peace working together. And it's important to stop at this point and remember what Paul's talking about. He's not talking about joy and peace, again, being some kind of a personality type, right? Just as a joyful person isn't this person who's all bubbly and cheery all the time necessarily, when he's talking about peace, he's not talking about this dude that's all just like calm and cool, like, yeah, whatever, man. It's all good, you know? It's peace. <laughs> I was not alive in the 60s, so that's not me, all right? He's not talking about a personality type. When he's talking about being filled with all joy and peace, you guys, you guys got to know he's talking about the fruit of the Spirit. Paul's praying is that the God of hope would fill you with the evidence of the fruit of the Spirit at work in your life. You guys know what the fruit of the Spirit is? For the fruit of the Spirit is love, number one. It's a good one. Number two, joy. Number three, peace. Right? Patience, goodness, kindness. Keep going, guys. You guys were in children's church. You guys know that, right? All the little people in here are like, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Because they know. Because they learn. Adults. Unless we change and become like children, we'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Maybe you guys need to go over there and get some more lessons, huh? <laughs> peace. You know what peace is? Peace is the, non, is the normal, non-warring condition of something. Do you hear that? The normal, non-warring condition of something. We look at people who have peace in the midst of a chaotic world, and we think they're weird. Actually, they're normal. That's, that's normal. That's the way it should be when we are dialed in to the God of hope. If you are internally or externally or both a train wreck that is in a constant state of chaos, so you're not filled with peace. That makes sense, right? Because it's this inward settledness of the soul, and it has to come out at the same time. Just as joy is going to come out, it's going to look different for everybody. For some people, joy comes out bubbly. For some people, it just comes out uh, in a different way. But it's inward settledness of the soul. This peace also 
comes out. That no matter what's going on around you, you know that God has it under control. Let us be those who allow the God of hope to fill us with peace as well as joy. All right, number four, exude. All right? If you don't know what that is, it basically means uh, overflow. That we may overflow with hope. See, I can't use overflow because, number one, I already used overflowing, right? And secondly, then it wouldn't have spelled out hope. It would have spelled out hopo, which I don't know what that is. So (laughs) we're going with exude, all right? I could have made something up, but that would have been weird, all right? Paul goes on to say, so that, okay? The turn in the prayer here is where Paul is going to outline the why behind the what, okay? This is why I'm praying that the God of hope would fill you with all joy and peace. This is why I'm praying that. So that as you trust in him, hope comes out of you. Not by your own strength, but by the power of his spirit. And not just that it comes out of you, but that it is overflowing out of you. That you overflow with hope that it exudes from every pore of your body. Now, what does that look like? Here's what it doesn't look like. It doesn't look like working harder to try to figure out how to have hope, right? Because that's what a lot of us do. We're like, okay, now I need to figure out how to have more hope, right? No, it's about tapping into the one who not only has an abundant supply, but who's actually in charge of all hope, who actually is hope. He is our hope. I think everyone in here could use some hope. Personally, I do. I don't think there's one person on the face of the earth who doesn't need more hope because it's the God of hope that gives it. And we need more God, right? Anybody got enough God? Anybody's like, I got enough God, I'm good. You're not, I guarantee it. The good news is this, God has hope for you and not just a little bit, but tons, like infinite supply. And as we continue to look to him and trust in him and as hope, hope grows in us and wells up in us and spreads in us, Guess what he has? More. More and more and more. Now, if your hope is small and shriveled and barely there, he's saying, I have it. I have more. I have hope for you. Okay? He is, again, both the source and the supplier of our hope. And his supply, it's infinite. It's never ending. So when the Apostle Paul prays this prayer for his people, it's a prayer for us today as well. That the God of hope would fill us with all joy and peace as we trust in him so that we may overflow with hope by the power of his spirit. The only way to do that is to continually be connected to him. And as uh, we're kind of wrapping this up today, I want to give you a couple things that I hope for, for you guys. Okay? First thing. Spend more time in the word of God between now and Christmas. Spend more time in his word between now and Christmas. Here's what's going to happen in the next 25 days. Chaos. <laughs> Chaos is coming. Chaos started already. Anybody go shopping on Friday or Thursday night? I went out on Thursday night. Me and my wife went shopping. We went to Walmart on Thursday night. It was actually decent. I mean, it, w- it wasn't a bad experience. I love Walmart, so it's fine. Um, but it was a little chaotic in there. Like, there was new lines. You didn't know where you were supposed to go, and there were different lines, and it was like, this isn't normal Walmart. This is a whole different Walmart going on right now. So it was like Walmart on steroids or something. You know what I'm saying? Some of you people right now are like, <laughs> like, so scared. <laughs> don't, don't be. It's fine. It was good, right? Chaos, though. It was a little bit of chaos going on. People didn't know where things were at, right? You're like, hey, where's this thing at? Oh, it's over by the milk. Where's this electronic component? Oh, it's down by the bread. I'm like, what? What is going on, right? So there's going to be chaos. You know what else is going to happen in the next 25 days? Worry. Anxiety. Is this person going to like this gift? Can I afford this gift? Am I going to make my kids happy? Am I going to make my parents happy? Am I going to do this? Is it going to be good? Is it going to be bad? Or start worry is going to happen. You know what else? Anger is going to happen. People get mad. People 
become angry during this time of year. Depression is going to get happen. Sadness is going to get happen. Cause some people, this isn't a good time of year. There's things that happen this time of year that remind them of things. You know, maybe we didn't all grow up having, you know, awesome Christmases, so Christmas time is a hard time. Or maybe you lost a loved one this time of year, so it's a hard time, you know? There's going to be sadness. There's going to be busyness. How many people have to go to Christmas parties? <laughs> Lori. <laughs> Sorry. Me and Lori work at my other job. We work for the same company, I guess you'd call it. And they have these Christmas parties you've got to go to in all these different counties. And for the last, like, 10 years, I had to go to them. So, like, on Monday, I had to go to Eugene. And then on, like, I don't remember, Tuesday, I had to go to Roseburg. And then Thursday, I had to go to Medford or vice versa, something like that. And the whole first week of December, I was gone at these, these holiday parties. I don't have to go anymore, which I'm super thankful about. Lori still has to go, so you can be praying for her. <laughs> right? There's all this stuff. There's holiday parties, and there's, oh, I've got to get these gifts to these people. I've got to take these gifts to these people. I've got to, you know, this. So much busyness going on. And it would be easy to be like, oh, yeah, you know what? I'm going to get back on track with my Bible reading at the first of the year, right? My resolution I'm going to read the Bible in a year, or I'm going to read the Bible at all. Whatever. Listen, don't fall for that, okay? Not, not reading the Bible. I mean, don't fall for that, like, putting it off until the beginning of the year. I'm giving you a suggestion on how to keep your head on straight for the next 25 days. Get into his word. Right now, if you're like, I hardly ever read the Bible, just commit to doing it like a couple times a week. If you read it a couple times a week, double up. If you're like most every day, man, hit every day. If you're an everyday reader, man, shoot up to twice a day or something. Is it going to solve all your problems? Technically, yes. But is it some kind of magic formula? No. But you will find yourself, the more time you spend in his word, tapped in to the one who gives us hope, tapped into the God of hope. You're going to find yourself tapped into him, listening to him, rather than listening to all this stuff that's going on around you. It's through his word and his spirit that the God of hope is revealed to us. So why wouldn't we do that, right? Spend a little more time in his word, then we'll walk through this season, and our minds will be a little more focused on what Advent is all about. Right? Not just, oh, I've got to get the next gift or whatever. We will be thinking constantly of, oh, that's right, Jesus came as a baby and was born. That's why we're celebrating this time. And he's Emmanuel, which means God with us right now. And he's coming back again. That's far more important than whatever Christmas gift you're going to buy this year. The second thing that I'd like you to do, if you really want to make it through this next 25 days, and this one's going to be a little harder, actually, than the first one. Identify some of the things that you have misplaced your hope in. Maybe it's a person. Maybe it's a job or money or thought process or whatever. Could be something good, good or bad. Identify those things. Now, don't get mad at those things, right? If you put your hope in a person and you realize they've constantly let you down, don't be like, jerk, right? Like, it's their fault. Just identify those things. Recognize that all those vessels leak to some degree, some more than others. Name the things that you've been trying to find satisfaction or fulfillment or deliverance or hope that have not given it. Maybe write them down. Maybe, maybe even share them with somebody close. Like, hey, here's the stuff I've been putting my hope in that I don't want to do that anymore. And then let them go. You know, some people write stuff down and then they light it on fire. If you want to do that, that's fine. Just be safe, okay? <laughs> I don't want anybody like, house burns down. They're like, Pastor Dale told me to light stuff on fire. That's not what I'm saying, all right? Let them go. And instead of hoping in them, allow the God of hope to fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit, right? You'll find when you let go of those things that you'd hoped in, some of them will actually come to pass, right? Maybe you hoped in this, this new job, and then you're like, okay, you know what? I'm putting my hope in the, in the God of hope. I'm not hoping in that job anymore. And then, lo and behold, you get the job. 
or you get the promotion, or you get the raise, or you get whatever, guess what happens then? That thing doesn't get your praise. God gets your praise, because you know it's the one you put your hope in that did the thing that you wanted done. You guys get it? It was way better. And if those don't, things don't come to pass, and you don't get the job or the promotion or whatever, it's going to be okay because you're not basing your hope in those things, so therefore you're not destroyed just because you didn't get the job. You're like, huh, I guess the God of hope has something else for me. I'll just continue to hope in him. Because God's not going to let us down. As we leave this place today, remember that Jesus is our hope. He doesn't just give it to us. He came to earth to be hope and will come back as our only hope. Right? When he comes back, that's our only hope. I want to read one more thing as we finish up today. I had to look this up. There's a song. Of course, almost all of the stuff that I, like, I think about, it comes from a song. And I'm like, ooh, that's a good song. Oh, they probably got it from like the Bible. And then they did. So Psalm 25. This is a third day song that I like. But it's actually Psalm 25. So I just want you guys to get this straight. Psalm 25 didn't rip it off from third day. Third day <laughs> ripped it off from Psalm 25. Because you might like third day's version better. Just saying. Okay. In you, Lord, my God, I put my trust. I trust in you. Do not let me be put to shame, nor let my enemies triumph over me. No one who hopes in you will ever be put to shame. But shame will come on those who are treacherous without cause. Show me your ways, Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me, for you are God my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. Remember, Lord, your great mercy and love, that for they are from old. Do not remember the sins of my youth and my rebellious ways. According to your love, remember me, for you, Lord, are good. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in his ways. He guides the humble in what is right and teaches them his way. All of the ways of the Lord are loving and faithful toward those who keep the demands of his covenant. For the sake of your name, Lord, for, forgive my iniquity, though it is great. Who then are those who fear the Lord? He will instruct them in the ways they should choose. They will spend their days in prosperity, and their descendants will inherit the land. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. My eyes are ever on the Lord, for only he will release my feet from the snare. Turn to me and be gracious to me, for I am lonely and afflicted. Relieve the troubles of my heart and free me from my anguish. Look on my affliction and my distress and take away all my sins. See how numerous are my enemies and how fiercely they hate me. Guard my life and rescue me. Do not let me be put to shame, for I take refuge in you. May integrity and uprightness protect me, because my hope, Lord, is in you. That's Psalm 25, and that's the psalmist saying over and over again, my hope is in the God of hope, because that's the only place to put it. Let's pray. Guys, we come before you today. We thank you for being our hope, Lord. Right now, I just... Um, I pray that each of us in this room would just um, lay before you the things that we have been putting our hope in, even if, especially if it's ourself. God, that we would lay that before you, and we would say, these things leak. These things, they're not going to fulfill us. They're not going to satisfy us. They're not going to deliver us. They're not going to make things better. And we would put those before you, and we would walk away from them. And instead, God, we would focus on you. We would allow you, the God of hope, to fill us with all joy and peace as we choose to trust in you. And as that happens, that we then would overflow with hope through the Holy Spirit. God, you are our hope. Right now, today, we declare we put our hope in you and you alone. Everything else, it doesn't, it doesn't even hold a candle to you, Lord. So this morning, we choose to put our hope in you and we choose to, to walk that out. God, you're good to us. I thank you. I thank you that we know that our hope is not displaced when we put it in you. And I thank you that you continue to lead us and guide us and direct us and fill us. 
that in you we can be satisfied and delivered. In you we can receive what it is that we need and what you have for us. And so, God, I pray that we would stay in that place of being filled by you. Our hope is in you, Lord, and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen.